But friends, we want to read, read together in Matthew chapter 21. And just while you're turning there again, let me just thank Martin for his, his ministry amongst us this evening. And we do appreciate it very much, Martin. We know we have a busy schedule and so on. It's great, really great to have you. And we thank you for that. But we're in Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to begin to read in verse 6 of the chapter, please. Matthew 21 and verse 6. And the disciples went and they did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes. And they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, Is it, it is written, My House shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what they say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Let's drop down verse 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests, this is the following day, and when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. We're going to end our reading there, and as always, we we look to the Lord, trusting that his blessing will rest upon it. You know, it's Palm Sunday, of course, and it would be wrong to go through the the yearly calendar and think about Palm Sunday or let Palm Sunday pass without at least reading the scripture that tells us of how our Lord Jesus Christ on that triumphant occasion rode down into Jerusalem and how they They shouted as we read before him, 
Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And as we begin to look at these verses before us this evening, we're confronted by a question. And this is what I want to leave with you tonight. We are confronted by a question. We see it right there in verse 28. Let me read that verse to you again. He says right at the beginning of the verse, But what think ye? Friends, that's what I want to leave with you this evening. But what think ye? Because this evening, this question comes to each one of us. And it's there, I believe, to make us think. Not just to listen, but to think. You see, there are some who perish for want of thought. And there are some others who perish for wrong thinking. And so, this evening, let's think carefully about what is being presented to us here. In the verses that we have before us. You see the priests and the elders. Had asked Jesus in verse 23. He comes into the temple. It says the lame came to him. And it says the blind. And he healed them. And the elders and the scribes in the temple. They're not one bit happy about that. Imagine people getting healed. In the house of God. Imagine people experiencing. The power of God. In the house of God. And you see what Jesus was doing here. He had upset the tables of the money changers. He had drove them out of the temple. This, by the way, was the second time that he had done that. He did it the first time and they all came back again. But this is the second time in his ministry that he has done that. And he has upset the routine of what was happening in the house of God. And so the scribes and the elders, they come to him and they say, What do you think you're doing? Who gives you the right? By what authority? Do you do these things? Or who gave you this authority? And so Jesus asks them about John the Baptist. Now, let me just explain that. And the verses explain it anyhow. But Jesus asks them the baptism of John. Was it from God? Was it from heaven? Or was it of men? And he's as good as saying to them, or he does say to them, what do you think about that? And you see, they have a problem in their minds. They have a problem in their hearts. Because they say... If we recognize John's ministry as being God sent, then he's going to say to us, why did you not repent? Why did you not believe it? Why did you not do what John told you to do? But if we say it's not from God, but it's of man, well, the people believe that John's a prophet, so we're going to be in big trouble with them. Have you ever been in that situation? For it doesn't matter what answer really you give, you're in big trouble because your actions haven't really corresponded properly with what you've already heard. And so they refuse to answer Jesus, the question he asks. And so quite simply, he refuses to tell them the answer to the question that they ask him. Friends, I think that's an amazing thing. And I say it's amazing because, listen, Jesus Christ is a heart of love. Jesus Christ is a heart of compassion. Jesus Christ has the heart of God which brought him from heaven's glory to die upon a cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ doesn't need one of us. And because they refused to answer his question, and he said, okay, go your way. I refuse to answer you the question that you have asked me. And then he gives this little parable. But what do you think about this? You see, the way to understand the authority of Jesus, the way to understand the authority of Christ is to discover our real condition before him. And he presents this story to them. He holds this little parable up to them. It's like a mirror. And as he speaks it to them, he's as good as saying to them, take a good look at yourselves. Take a good look and see what you're really like. Take a good look and see what you're really doing. And discover your real condition, your real state before God. Because you see, those who pride themselves in their own supposed goodness... And those who pride themselves in what they are, and those who pride themselves in who they are, and those who pride themselves in what they have achieved, 
will always remain in ignorance of Christ's authority. Our brother sang tonight, I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, friends, tonight, those of us who profess to be saved, that's all we have tonight. It's not anything in what we are. It's not anything in what any one of us has done. It's not anything in what any of us have ever achieved or hoped to achieve. It's because of the Lamb of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And all we have tonight is the fact that we approach an Easter season and we look to a cross of Calvary and on the cross of Calvary the blessed Son of God laid down his life and he shed his blood so that you and I could be forgiven. That's all we have tonight. But those who pride themselves in anything outside of that remain in ignorance to the authority, the real authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see this little parable. Now let's look at what the Father commanded for a minute. Because he says in that verse, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first. Verse 28, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Boy, I always used to hit that. You know, I grew up on a, on a farm. My father farmed part-time. It was a small farm. And a lot of it was done whenever he got home from work at night. Whenever we were home from school. And you had to have the homework done. And then the next thing you knew, you were out in the fields working along with him. And many a time I stood in the field. God forgive me. But many a time I stood in the field and I hoped the machinery would break down so we could get back into the house. So I know what this is like. But he comes to the first and he says, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Dear one, listen to me tonight, please. If you are saved, the Father's vineyard needs workers. The Lord's looking his people to serve him where and however he wants them to do that. He needs people who are prepared to work for him, to work with him. People through whom he can work. And let me say tonight, if you're saved, make sure that you're aligning yourself with the purpose of God for your life. Because he has a purpose just for you. That only you can fill. A role that only you can play. Lives that only you can touch for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you tonight, if you're saved, make sure you're walking in relationship with him in such a way that he can bless you. That he can fill you. And that he can use you. And can I say this to you tonight? He never uses anybody he doesn't fill. And he never fills anybody that he doesn't use. And so we need to have our lives aligned properly with him. That we know his blessing. We know the the power of his spirit. We know his touch upon us. That we are anointed and enabled to do whatever it is that he calls us to do. People through whom he can work. But here, coming back for a moment to the story, we see this father, and and he gives this command. Son, go work today in my vineyard. And look at the father's claim on this young man, on both of them, in fact, because he calls him son. Son, go work today in my vineyard. Look at the desire of the father's heart. You see, the father has something for them to do. And don't just look at the desire in the Father's heart. He has something for them to do. But friends, look at the urgency of the Father's request. Work today. I have something for you to do, son. And that's something I want you to do it today. Not tomorrow, not next month, not next year. I want you to do it today. I need you to do it now. I need you to do it now. You know, friends, the Scripture says today... If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And I want to say in this meeting tonight, the Father has something for us to do. I've already spoken to the saved. If you know Christ, there's a work for Jesus, the hymn says, that only you can do. But tonight, if you're unsaved, can I say to you lovingly, the Father has something for you to do as well. His will. You know, we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He has a will for every single person. And you could be sitting in this meeting tonight and perhaps you don't know him uh, in a personal way as our brother Martin was sharing about his experience. 
We sang that little song at the beginning about how he lives in me. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and that's not your experience. Can I say to you tonight, God has a will for you. Young person, older person, whoever you may be. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17, the Apostle Paul writing to the church there says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, he prays that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Can I ask you tonight, if you're sitting in this meeting and you perhaps don't know Christ in a personal way, and tonight you're still living in your sin, can I ask you tonight, do you really know what the will of God is? Do you know what it is that the Lord would have you to do, as he says in this little parable? Something for you to do. Do you really know that God is something that he wants you to do today? You see, God has a will for every person. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world. He came to fulfill the will of the Father. And Jesus left the throne of glory. He came into this world. And the Bible tells us he came to destroy the works of the devil. The Bible tells us that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I love that. Because he came to seek after those who were lost in sin. But not only did he come to seek after them, but he came to break the power of the one who holds them in that sin. And so Jesus came into this world because the will of God is that you might be free. The will of God for your life is that you would be free from the burden of your sin. That you would be free from the penalty of your sin. That you would be free from the judgment of your sin. That you would be free to walk in right relationship with a God who loves you. With a love that's from everlasting unto everlasting. That's the will of God. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. Dear one, listen to me tonight. The will of God for you is that you might be saved. That you might get to know Jesus. That you might have the joy of having the burden of your sin lifted away. And that you might know the power of the precious blood of Jesus cleansing you from all sin. To bring you into a right relationship. To be reconciled with the God who puts the very breath in your lungs. The God who keeps your heart beating. God wants you to be in relationship. That's his will tonight. That's his will. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, He will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the will of God for your life this evening. And you see, God has got something for you to do. You could be here tonight. Perhaps he has spoken to your life before. And you know that Jesus came into this world. And you know that Jesus was the Son of God. And you know that Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary. And you know that he died for sin. And perhaps you're here and God has spoken to you before. And you've never done anything about that. God's will for your life is that you would come into right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps you're here this evening and you've heard him call your name. You've heard him speaking into your heart in times past. And tonight you know your state, you know your condition before him. And you know that there's still sin in your life and in your heart. But you've heard him call you. You've heard him tug at your heart string. You know, I used to sit in church years ago, long before I was saved. You know, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And I didn't understand salvation. I didn't fully know what all of that was about. But I knew there was something just lovely about Jesus. Someone who would come from heaven and die upon a cross, innocent, and allow people to nail him to a cross. And he said he called himself the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And I didn't comprehend that, didn't understand that. But listen to me. I sat in church many a time and that touched my heart. Touched my heart. I wonder has God ever touched your heart in that way? 
And you've sensed that. You've, you've, you've experienced that. You've known that. But you've done nothing whatsoever in response to that. And you see, dear one, tonight, that's what God would want you to do. His will is that you would be in right relationship with him. And what he wants you to do tonight is respond to his love as he reaches out to you. But you know your state. And you know your condition before him. And I wonder, have you ever responded or have you sensed that call and never responded to it? Friend, I want to tell you tonight, there's nothing greater than obeying God. Nothing greater. Young person, there's nothing greater in life than obeying God. Get that. Let that sink deep down into your heart. There is nothing greater than obeying God. There is nothing as satisfying, nothing that will bless you more in life than obeying God. Doing what God tells you to do. And there's nothing that will bring more sorrow into your heart than disobeying God. Disobedience brings pain and sorrow and sadness. And let me say tonight, that goes for saint and for sinner alike. I can remember back in, it was back in the year of 19, I think it was around 1982. Whenever the Lord first called us uh, into his work in those days, it was video, Christian video ministry. It was very much a pioneer work that I felt at that time the Lord had called us into. And I was one night sharing our vision and what the Lord had, had done for us. Uh, it was in a meeting in Belfast. And after the meeting was over, an elderly man, now he wasn't an old man, but he was an elderly man. I, I suppose I'm an elderly man now. So he would have been somebody at that time, my age is, do you follow me there? You know what I'm trying to say there? Okay, but, but he was an elderly gentleman and he came up to me at the end and he said to me, Brother, he says, you have a glorious opportunity in front of you. A glorious opportunity. And he said to me, make sure that you seize it. And then with tears, his, his eyes, they just welled up with tears. And he told me how the Lord had called him so many years before. And he sensed the call of God into service, into the work of God. This man was a Christian. He was a believer. And he had sensed the call of God all those years before into the Lord's work. But he hadn't obeyed. And he hadn't sought to follow that through. And he said to me, I have regretted it. All of my lifetime. I have regretted that. And he says, my life has been wasted. Because I didn't seek to follow and obey the God. Obey God. Friends, disobedience brings sorrow. Brings dryness. And this evening I would urge each one who's here to obey the Father's command. And to come to him. To respond to his offer of love. And if you're saved, work for him and do it now today while you can. For none of us knows what another day brings forth. But look here very quickly at what the son said. Because we have two responses in this parable. The first response is in verse 29. And it's a decided refusal. Son, go work. I have something for you to do. Son, I want you to do it now. And he said, I will not. I will not. Have you been saying that to God? Have you been saying that? You see, there are many people who respond to God like that. Young people say, oh, I'll wait till I live life a, a bit longer. Other people say, I'll wait, I'll wait till I achieve this, or I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I do that, or I'll wait till I, I get to that stage before I do it. And so many people just say, I will not. And they hear the gospel, and they flatly refuse, and they say, no way. I'm not giving my life over to that. And they just flatly refuse. It's like saying, look God, I have something else of my own to look for, to look after. I have something else of my own to do. I haven't got time for you, God. And they just say, no. I have my own plans. I have my own purposes to attend to. Listen, dear one. God can change your plans. Don't ever forget that. God can change your plans. In a moment, 
Whenever everything seems to be going well in life, everything can just suddenly change. Because God can change it in an instant. Don't presume upon tomorrow. Don't presume upon another time. Don't presume upon a better time. You might never have a better time than you have right at this moment. Because God can do things in your life that can make plans that you have up ahead seem very, very, very unimportant. And I've seen that over and over and over again. A sudden illness. Something happens. And listen, the plans go out the window. What odds about the plans? All I want is my health. All I want is to be lifted up out of this. God can change that in just an instant. So don't plan ahead and leave God out of plans. Because you may never see them accomplished or may never see them fulfilled. I know people who've had big plans. No time for God until a crisis hit their family. I know a man, a young man, and one night out of the blue, he just took a sudden heart attack. And all the plans that he had, listen, they were on the back burner after that. What odds whether he ever saw them accomplished or whether he didn't. All he needed was to get well again. God has a way of doing those things. You see, friends, what are our plans? Our plans, they are nothing. Our plans are dreams that we can't even be sure of. Yet we get caught up with what we want to do. And we refuse God. And we say, I will not. And then we go away and we live a life that's opposed to the will of God. And a life that's out of sympathy with the Father's purpose. Is that where you could be at this evening? We see a decided refusal. Very quickly, we see also a ready consent. The next son, verse 30, he came to the second. And he said likewise to him, and, and he answered and said, I go, sir. And then three little words at the end of the verse says that he went not. You see, here's someone who speaks with marked respect. I go, sir. And it would seem that this person has great reverence for God, great reverence for the Father in this story. And he seems to have a great zeal for the Father's work. You know, someone has called this son the only lipped professor. And his descendants are still among us today. We'll serve God with our lips. We'll go through all of the motions of religion. But we'll never allow God in to do anything more than that. And we'll serve him with our lips. They'll show, these people show a respect for God. These people show a respect for the things of God. These people show a respect for the work of God. But it only comes from their lips because there's nothing alive down within the heart. And there's an emptiness there. And you see, these two sons could represent two classes of people. There are the ungodly, and then there are the upright, the respectable, the religious, those that walk the clean side of the street, so to speak. And you see, it's easy to look at those on the unclean side of the street and say, oh, they need Christ, they need to be saved, they need to be forgiven. But it's so much more difficult to look at people on the clean side of the street and say they need to be saved, they need to be forgiven, they need to be cleaned up as well. And we're inclined to look at the two and we see them in contrast the one to the other. And that's exactly what Jesus is speaking about here. There's a religious hierarchy that he's speaking to on this occasion who show lip service to God through all of the religion that they're involved in. And at the end of the story he says, look at you guys and with all your religion and with all of your pomp and with all of the ceremony that you're involved in and the harlots and the publicans go into the kingdom of God before you because you've missed it. You're empty. And you pay lip service to God but you have absolutely no experience of God and the reality of God in your heart and in your life. You know, the Bible talks about those that draw near to the Lord with their lips. God's not deceived by that. Because in his word God says, but their hearts are far from me. Could that be you tonight? And maybe you're not on the unclean side of the street. But there's a religion in you. There's an upright, there's a respectable thing in you. But you only draw near with your lips. And in your heart, listen, you're far from God. And you know it. Nobody else maybe does, but you do. And you're far from God. 
What about you this evening? I wonder, is there anyone here? And you fit into one of these categories. And perhaps as I've said, you're here and you've always said no to the pleadings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has reminded you over and over and over again that he loves you. Friends, Calvary proves that. He loves us. The Bible says he loved us and he gave himself for us. And he has brought that truth to your heart over and over and over again. But you have said, no, I will not. And he has pointed you to Calvary. And he has pointed you to the pain. And he has pointed you to the agony. And he has pointed you to the shame that he bore for you. But you've said no. I will not. Or perhaps you're here this evening. And you're just going through the motions. Yes, Lord, I go. Yes, Lord, I will. But deep down within, you know that your actions... And you know that your words, and you know that really at the end of the day you're full of nobody, not even yourself, because you know in your heart that you don't have Christ living within your soul. And he sees, and he knows the condition of all of our hearts. Let me wind this up very quickly. Maybe religious, maybe religion, maybe religious activity has kept you from really doing what the Father wants you to do. What do these sons actually do in this story to close with? Well, there's often a vast difference between a person's profession and a person's actions. And so in verse 31, Jesus asks, what are these two did the will of his Father? And you see, it's not a matter of which of them talked the best. Or which of them gave the best answer to the Father? The scripture tells us that it's not what you and I say that's important. Friends, it's what we do. It's what we do that's important. What we do. And in fact, it's what we do with Jesus that's important. Not what we do with church. Not what we do with religious activity. Not what we do with the Word. It all comes down to what we do with the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here again we see two outcomes. Let me read verse 29 again. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and he went. You see, this one repented eventually and obeyed. Repentance always comes before the doing of God's will. Always. Always comes before it. And praise God, we can see here that even when we have said, No, Lord. Oh, thank God, He still will receive us. Hallelujah. He still will receive us. If we have a change of heart. And so one repented and obeyed. The other promised And he failed. In verse 30 he said, I go, sir. But the last three words says, and went not. You see, friends, tonight I've known people who said no. But whenever they repented, Jesus gloriously saved them. Hallelujah. Gloriously saved them. And I've known others who said, yes, I agree with what you're saying. I agree that he died on the cross of Calvary. I agree that he's the son of God. I agree that he takes away sin. I agree that he shed his blood to take away the sin of the world. But they didn't do anything about it. Where do you stand with this? Now listen to me. Let me finish where I began. The scripture asks the question, but what think ye? What do you think? Dear one, listen to me. Who is this Jesus? Who is he? You see, if he's God, and if he came from heaven to die upon a cross to take away your sin, then why have you not responded to him, the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you? Why have you not responded to him? You see, that's what Jesus asks these individuals about John the Baptist. If his ministry is from God, why did you not do something in your life about that? 
And he's saying exactly the same to you and to me tonight. If he's God, if he's the Son of God incarnate, if he's God's answer for sin, if he's the only way to be in the presence of God for all eternity, why have you done nothing about it? If he's the only way, it's only a fool who will turn their back on that. That's what Jesus asks here. And I'm asking you tonight, where do you stand in the midst of all of this? How do you see the Lord Jesus Christ? How do you see him? You see, maybe you've been saying no. And tonight you need to repent and say, yes, Lord. I believe you died for my sin. And I'm asking you to save me now. Or maybe you're here tonight and you've been too religious. And you've paid all of the lip service. Too respectable. You've paid all of the lip service. But this safe thing, no, no. Where do you stand? If he's God, he's your only option. And if he's God and he has paid and provided for you at the cross of Calvary, why have you not closed in with that offer of love and that offer of mercy? And you see tonight, that's what we're asking you to do. What? Do you think about this? You personally. It doesn't matter what a raver like me says. What do you think personally about the Son of God? Listen, we're saying to you tonight, do something about it for your own sake. Not because Elam tells you to do it. Or not because some shouting preacher at the front of the meeting tells you you need to do it. Do it for your own sake. Because if Christ is God's son and Christ is the answer for sin, we have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. And we all need him. And you need to do it for yourself, for your sake. And so tonight, that's what we're asking you to do. Because the Bible says, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. One said, no, I'm not doing it. But afterward, he repented. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And so tonight, in an instant, at this meeting tonight, if you see Jesus, if he's speaking to your heart, and if you see him for all that he is, maybe for the first time in your life, don't turn your back on him. But close in with him and receive that forgiveness and receive that salvation that only he can provide. And I'm asking you tonight, what is your response going to be here, now, this moment, in this meeting? What is your response going to be to Jesus? What do you think? Isn't it time you were saved? Isn't it time you had that sin dealt with? Isn't it time that if there's a right relationship available to you with God, isn't it about time you had it? But dear one, it depends on you tonight. And so let's pray together, please. Forgive me for repeating it, but I'm saying it again. What do you think? Now you weigh it up. This is between this between you and God. This is not between you and me. This is between you and God. And God's saying to you now, what do you think about this? Isn't it time that you really got to grips with this? Isn't it time that you really did something about it? And so I'm asking you now, just in the stillness of your own heart, to reach out to him. How do you do that? Just ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Her brother sang, I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He shed that blood to save you, to forgive your sin, to cleanse you from sin. Just ask him to forgive you and ask him to wash you clean. It's as simple as that. But you have to mean it from your heart. And dear one, I can't make you do that. And if I could, I would. Because for so many of us here tonight, we've experienced that and we know it's the right thing to do. 
But I would only urge you tonight, just take him at his word. He's a savior who died upon the cross for you. Seek him now while he may be found. Call upon him now while he's near. And just say, yes, Lord. Forgive my sin. Wash me clean. Be my savior. I want to tell you tonight, if you'll do that, he'll meet with you. And he'll cleanse you. And he'll forgive you. And he'll be your savior. And you'll know his presence in your life from this moment forward. But it rests squarely with you. Can I say to you tonight, I'm going to pray, but can I say to you tonight, if God's speaking to your heart, don't go away from here tonight without doing something about it. At the end of the meeting, I'll only be too happy to speak to you, to pray with you, to tell you. If you need anything more answered, we'll do our best to do everything for you that we can do. But why don't you settle it now? Just now. And Lord, we thank you for your presence amongst us this evening. We thank you for the ministry and song, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your heart tonight, a heart that receives the whosoever will, just by reaching out to you and calling upon you. We thank you for that provision that you have made available through the blood that was shed and the sacrifice that was made upon the cross of Calvary, that all men might be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Lord, you know every heart bowed before you now. We're asking this very night, this evening, now, Lord, that hearts will be saved, that lives will be changed, and that something will happen deep within souls in this meeting that will change them for time and for eternity. Bless your word. Bless it deep in every life, Lord, and cause it, cause it to be fruitful. Because we thank you for anointing and we thank you for liberty in the spirit this evening. And we believe, Lord, that you're speaking to hearts now. Complete that work, we pray. And may there be miracles of grace in this meeting this evening. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.